All right, good morning. Our uh, head of audiovisual, Bill Beatty, was joking with me this morning because he always teases me that when I preach, I like to move around a lot. And he said, normally, if a stage is here, the person's going to stay within the stage. And he said, Johnny, you're going to be doing something like this, where you're leaning against a pillar. And I said, that's kind of like Samson. And we know what happened when Samson leaned against the pillar. It wasn't good for him or anybody else. So I'm going to do my best to stay within this stage area. Um, when I grew up, one of my favorite movies uh, was the old Disney classic, The Absent-Minded Professor. In this 1961 classic, I learned this week, it's actually the first Disney movie that generated a sequel. It did so well. But in this movie, there's a professor named Professor Brainerd. And he's got the words brain in his name. And he's a genius. He's a professor of chemistry at Medfield College. And throughout the course of the story, Professor Brainerd discovers a new compound that seems to increase in energy as it strikes against a surface. And this compound looks like rubber. And it can kind of fly, so he named it Flubber. And in the movie, this professor is demonstrated as being this brilliant professor. And I remember as a kid, when I watched this movie, the only memories I really have are these guys jumping up and down a basketball court, hitting their heads on the ceiling, or Professor Brainerd harnessing the energy of Flubber and flying his Model T. Well, a few weeks ago, we watched that movie as a family. And it's really good, by the way. But my perspective changed as I watched the movie because as a kid, all I thought about was Flubber. And, and a few weeks ago, I got to enjoy the plot line. And, and one of the things in the movie that was so funny was how brilliant this professor was, but how forgetful he was, hence the name, The Absent-Minded Professor. And, and something that this professor had done that blows our minds is that he forgot to show up to his own wedding three different times. <laughs> and you feel for his, his long-suffering fiance, who is still loyal to him, and this professor who has so much knowledge, and he has so much intellect, and yet he still can't make the wise decision. I wouldn't recommend not showing up for your own wedding, let alone three times. Which makes me ask the question, are knowledge and wisdom the same thing? And I think we would have to say, no, they're not. In the Oxford English Dictionary, the definition for knowledge is defined as the information, understanding, and skills gained through education or experience. You might say that knowledge is the acquisition of information. It's becoming acquainted with facts or observations or ideas through study and investigation. Whereas wisdom has been defined as the ability to make sensible decisions or give good advice because of the experience and knowledge that one has. Wisdom utilizes knowledge in the making of decisions. I've heard it once said that wisdom is applied knowledge. Or simply put, one person said, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is knowing not to put it in the fruit salad. We've all witnessed ourselves, someone else, or maybe even ourselves, possess knowledge in something, and yet that doesn't guarantee that we will make wise decisions. If I were to ask you, which would you rather have, knowledge or wisdom? I hope your answer would be both, <laughs> or at least a little bit of both. See, you can possess knowledge and not possess wisdom, but you cannot possess wisdom without at least a little bit of knowledge. And as Christians, we should not just want knowledge of the Lord that's detached from wisdom from the Lord. We should want to know the Lord so that we will be wise and receive wisdom from the Lord. But what kind of knowledge does the Lord 
want us to have of him? And what kind of wisdom does he desire from us? This morning I'd ask that you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, we are continuing our study within the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to be coming across a couple different groups of peoples who possess varying levels of knowledge and varying levels of wisdom. And after we leave here this morning, my goal is that we will leave here being knowledgeable and wise Christians. So let's pick up our text in Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. When the messengers of John had left, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. Now if you remember from last week, or if you weren't here last week, John the Baptist was in prison and he sent two of his disciples and asked Jesus, are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? And in John clearly earlier we've seen in the Gospels, knew that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John knew Jesus was the Messiah, and yet Jesus wasn't doing what John thought the Messiah would be doing. If the Messiah was going to set the prisoners free, don't you think the Messiah would have set his forerunner free? And John was discouraged. And Jesus sent a message back through his disciples to John, basically saying what he had done in, in, in a way saying, I am the Messiah, by telling them what all, the, all these things that Jesus was doing. And then he said, blessed is the one who does not take offense or stumble over me. And that's where we pick back up in our text today. So when those messengers had left, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. And he said, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed that is shaken by the wind? And a reed shaken by the wind is kind of like that grass right over there that's just moving back and forth. It's not exactly firm. It's moving. It's shifting. It's kind of like the difference between a flag and a flagpole. A flag moves every which direction north, south, east, west, and any, everything in between. A flag is controlled by the outside environment. What external forces are pushing upon it? And that's the direction that the flag goes. But a flagpole stands still no matter what. A flagpole is rooted and has depth and will not change no matter what the external forces are doing. I think that's what Jesus is saying. He's commending John. And he's saying John was not a vacillator. John was not this pliable person who just agreed with whatever was popular. John had conviction, and his conviction was the Word of God. And he was faithful, even if that wasn't popular. So Jesus is complimenting, and he says he was not a reed shaken by the wind. Verse 25, but what did you go see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who live splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. And he's saying John was not this silver spoon, live in a bubble palace kind of guy. He lived in the desert. He wore camel hair for his clothes. He ate locusts for his food. This guy was committed. And he knew his mission was to be the forerunner. He was to prepare the way for the Lord. And Jesus is saying, this man was not a compromiser. This man was not fickle. He was not pliable. He was firm. And he was committed to the Lord. And he says, but what did you go out and see? Verse 26, a prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. And Jesus is acknowledging John is not just a prophet, but he is the prophet who's been prophesied about. He is the one who is preparing the way for the Lord's expected one. In the Gospel of Matthew, in the, in the parallel account in Matthew 11, Jesus says, John is Elijah. And he's quoting Malachi. And Malachi was saying, Elijah is going to come. And Jesus is quoting Malachi 3.1. And he's saying he is the messenger who is preparing the way 
before the Lord. So Jesus is doing a couple things right here. He's saying John is the real deal, but do you see what else Jesus is saying? He's saying, I'm the Lord. Because in the Malachi pa passage, it, there's two messengers. There's the messenger who's the master of ceremonies, who's preparing the way, getting one, everyone ready for the primary speaker. And that primary speaker is the messenger of the covenant who is the speaker in Malachi 3, who is Yahweh of hosts. So Jesus is saying, John's the one who prepared the way for the Lord, and he's also indirectly saying, I'm the Lord. I'm the one that he's preparing the way for. And then in verse 28, Jesus says, But I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Another translation says, There's been no one who's ever been born who's greater than John. Yet, now this is fascinating, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now how does that make sense? How can John be the greatest of all, and yet someone who's even least in the kingdom of God be greater than John? And I think when we look at John was preparing the way for Messiah, and Jesus came to bear the penalty for our sins, and he did that at the cross. And after the cross, everyone who trusts in him, your sins are paid for. You are born again if you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior. If you've trusted in the payment He made at the cross with His blood. And I think what Jesus is saying is what John is preparing the way for. Even though John is the last and the greatest of the prophets, he lives in an era that pales in comparison to the era after the cross and to the blessing that anybody who has responded to what Jesus in the cross has done by trusting in Him. And we know that New Testament believers permanently possess the indwelling Holy Spirit. We are not only friends of God, but we are children of God, even to those who believe in His name. Now I believe that John the Baptist is a saved person, so I think Jesus is contrasting leading up to what John is preparing the way for and then everything after that. And the person who is saved is in a powerful and wonderful position in Christ. Sometimes you might feel like you're not that impressive of a Christian. You might get discouraged. And I want to remind you that we have everything in Christ. We have blessed, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You have so much more than you know if you have Jesus. And it's easy to forget that because the rest of the world doesn't say that. The rest of the world is all about the here and now and what we see with our eyes, or what we touch with our hands. But there is a real kingdom of God that oftentimes we can't see. Now we can see the manifestation of the kingdom of God and one day we will see the visible manifestation of the kingdom of God. And I want us to be encouraged that if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you have it made. You have it made! But that doesn't mean we don't go through trials. Of course we do. And those are not fun. I don't think anybody is jumping up and down saying, Yay, I get to experience pain. But we can still rejoice always because we know that when we go through the trial, we are not alone. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Emmanuel, God with us. If you're a believer, you have Jesus with you. Verse 29, when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice having been baptized with the baptism of John. Now this is in a very, very important verse in our passage. Because when you see this phrase, they acknowledge God's justice. That's kind of a, a, an interesting phrase. And, and the word is actually one word in the Greek. And believe it or not, it's the word for justify. Justify. 
So you could, you could literally say they justified God. They declared Him righteous. I like the NIV translation of this verse. It says they acknowledged that God's way was right. God's way is righteous. And then Luke tells us they acknowledged that God's way was right. They acknowledged God's justice. They justified God. How? Having been baptized with the baptism of John. Well, what was the baptism of John about? We already saw earlier in Luke 3, he says, Repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. John's message was saying, Your sin is a problem. And God has to deal with sin. And you have to acknowledge and become in agreement with the way God views your sin. I think about King David in Psalm 51 where he says, Against you and you alone, O Lord, I have sinned and not done what is right. How did the people and the tax collectors acknowledge God's justice? How did they justify God? They agreed with the message that John was preaching. That their sin was a problem. And they couldn't fix that problem on their own. They had to come to God on His terms. And they could only receive forgiveness of sins. Which all throughout the Bible, the only way forgiveness of sins can be possible is through a payment, a blood payment. And the only way it can be received is to receive by faith. So how did they align themselves with the message of John? And I think it's because they align themselves with the message of the problem of their sin and their need for God's salvation that they would receive by God's grace that they would receive through faith. And then look at verse 30. But, remember there's always contrast. Listen to the contrast. But the Pharisees and the lawyers, or the scribes, rejected God's purposes for themselves, not having been baptized with the baptism of John. If the crowds and the tax collectors justified God because they aligned with the message of John, then it's saying, the Pharisees and the scribes did not justify God because they rejected that message. They rejected John's message and therefore they rejected God's purpose for themselves. And I love that John read the verse this morning, 1 Timothy 2. Because what is God's purpose for people? 1 Timothy 2.4 God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Knowledge is important. Knowledge is important. But what do you do with that knowledge? Do you acknowledge that it's right? Or do you reject God's purpose for yourself? 1 Timothy 2.4 God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for many. The testimony given at the proper time. Jesus came to be our substitute. And you know, John and Jesus, they're on the same team. But they had two totally different ways of going about it. You might say they're teaching two different sides of the same coin. John's saying, you have sin and God's going to judge sin. And Jesus is saying, yes, that's true. And you can be saved by faith in God's provision. And they work together. They're not contrasting. Because you would never have a Savior if you never had a sin problem. If you didn't have a sin problem, then why did Jesus come? And if we could fix our sin problem on our own, then why did Jesus have to go to the cross and die? And the answer to that, you know this, is because there was no other way. There is no other mediator between God and men. Who could reconcile the relationship between God and men? It had to be the God-man, Jesus Christ. 
And you know what's kind of funny in verse 29 and verse 30 is the crowds and the tax collectors, those would be looked on as the common folk. <laughs> the, the not as knowledgeable people of the scriptures. And the Pharisees and the scribes, guess what they were known as? The ones who had vast knowledge of the scriptures. And wisdom is applying knowledge in making sound decisions, in making good decisions. So in, in one group we have people who do not possess that much knowledge, but they still possess enough knowledge to know that God's way is right, and they demonstrate wisdom by coming into agreement with God and trusting in Him. And then we have people who knew the Scriptures better than probably anybody in the history of the world. I've heard that some of these scribes memorized the entire Old Testament. They knew the Scriptures so well. But knowledge does not always equate with wisdom. And you can know a lot about God, but if you don't acknowledge and agree that He's right and we're wrong, if you don't agree that you have a problem that only He can fix, if you don't look to Him as your Savior, if you don't place your faith only in Him, you're not making a wise decision. And knowledge without wisdom when it comes to Jesus and the cross leads to eternity in hell. And a little bit of knowledge, not that much knowledge, but enough knowledge to know who Jesus is and what he did on the cross, you can be incredibly wise by saying, I trusted him. So let's keep going in our passage in verse 31. Jesus continues and says, To what then shall I compare this, the men of this generation, and what are they like? And I think what he's talking about is this, this group, this second group, the, the Pharisees and the scribes. It's a generic word for men. It's, it's anthropos. It's mankind in general. And he, I think he's comparing them to the scribes and the Pharisees. And in verse 32 he says, They're like children who sit in the marketplace and they call to one another. And they say, We played the flute for you. And you did not dance, and we sang a dirge, and you did not weep. And he's using this comparison of children who sit in the place where everybody's at, in the marketplace, that's where everybody's at. And he's saying they're so fickle, they're like children who are upset that nobody wants to do what they want them to do. I laugh with our own children, and it goes both ways. Sometimes it's big brother, or sometimes it's little sister, but I've, I've been on this side of parenting where one of them comes up and they says, Daddy, so-and-so doesn't want to play what I want to play. Tell them that they have to do what I want them to do. And I'm sure parents have experienced that. You have the son who wants to play with trucks and the daughter who wants to play with Barbies. And the daughter's upset that the son doesn't want to play with, tr with Barbies. All he wants to do is play with trucks. And as a parent, I say, well, you can't make him do that. You can't. You can encourage him, you can ask him to play with you, but if he wants to play with trucks, he's going to play with trucks. And, and, and Jesus is saying these are like children who get upset that other children aren't doing what they want them to do. And he's saying, I like the New Living Translation, it says, we played wedding songs and you didn't want to party, you didn't want to dance. And so we played funeral songs and you didn't want to mourn with us. And they get upset that nobody wants to do what they want them to do. So then Jesus continues and says, For John the Baptist has come eating no bread, drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of, of tax collectors and sinners. In the comparison of the funeral, the, so, the solemn, sober message of John, He's saying, John had a message that had to do with sin and judgment. You said, I don't want to agree with that. And then the Son of Man has a message where he's welcoming sinners and tax collectors. He say, come, come. And it's like the wedding. And they say, we don't want to have anything to do with that either. We don't want anything to do with that either. And then look at the last verse we'll be looking at today, verse 35. Jesus says, yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. You know what that word vindicate is? The same word in verse 29 for justify. A legitimate translation is wisdom is justified by her children. Shown to be right. And wisdom is shown to be right by the people who make the wise decision. 
not necessarily the people with the most knowledge. Because in this passage, we have people with a ton of knowledge about God and a lot of knowledge about the Bible, and yet they rejected God's purpose of salvation. They did not demonstrate good decision-making process. They did not make the wise decision because they wanted nothing to do with John's message and they wanted nothing to do with Jesus' message. And yet it was the crowds and the sinners and the tax collectors who had just enough knowledge to know God's way is right. And they justified God, and in Christ, therefore, God justified them. He declared them righteous on the basis of faith in God's plan of salvation. So earlier I asked you, I said, which would you prefer, to be knowledgeable or to be wise? And I hope that you would want to be both. And in, and in the, the immediate passage, we're talking about salvation is at stake. God wants you to trust in Him. If you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, make the wise decision and receive the grace of God. Receive the forgiveness of God by faith, by trusting in Him and not in yourself. You don't have to be a seminary professor to trust in Jesus. You just have to know who Jesus is and what He did on the cross. And you have to know that you can only trust in Him if you want to receive what He can give you. You have to trust in Him. But what about if you're already a Christian? What if you already have trusted in Christ? You already have made the wise decision. Does God want you to know more of Him? Absolutely He does. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. God wants us to know Him and God wants us to fear Him. And when we fear the Lord, that's the beginning of wisdom. James talks about if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for knowledge. And ask God to work in your heart that you can grow in both. And I think it starts with an attitude in our hearts that is submissive to the Lord and say, in, in which we can say, you're right. Just like the people in verse 29, they acknowledge that God's way is right. I think as Christians, we should acknowledge that God's way is right. Even when we don't understand it. Like John the Baptist. Because he didn't understand what was going on. Just a few verses earlier in this text, he's so confused, he's so discouraged. He's saying, this is not what I thought Messiah would be doing. And Jesus says, how blessed is the one who does not stumble over me, who does not take offense at me. You might say in a positive light, how blessed is the one who acknowledges that my way is right, even when you don't understand it. So how do you grow in your knowledge of the Lord? Spend time with Him. Spend time reading His Word, and not reading His Word and just flipping through, checking it off the list, but asking God to teach you before you get in the Word. So when you get in the Word, you say, Lord God, teach me about you. I don't want just knowledge. I want wisdom. And I want to know you in a relationship. I don't want to be smarter just to be smart. I want to be godly. I want to be faithful. I want to be in a relationship with you where I know you and I know that you know me. And where you have the humility to acknowledge that His way is right and that He should be king in our hearts and not ourselves. And if you have that heart attitude, if you have the humility to say, God's way is right even when I don't understand it, I believe that God will help you grow in knowledge of Him, but He will help you grow in wisdom as a believer, as a Christian, and that that will change the way that you live your life. God doesn't just want Christians who read the Bible and close it and doesn't do any change in their life. God wants us to apply what we learn. Is that not wisdom? Applied knowledge. God wants transformation in our hearts. 
so that we grow in our love of the Lord, that we can say, I love the Lord God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And because I love the Lord with all of my being, I will choose to love my neighbor as myself. Jesus summarized the, the, the whole law in those two commandments. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And it takes wisdom to do that. And it takes humility and wisdom to ask God to help us do that. So my prayer and my hope this morning is that as we leave here and we remember this passage, that we would want a knowledge of God, but we would want a knowledge of God that changes us so that we receive wisdom of God. And that we can leave here loving the Lord more and choosing to trust Him when we don't understand and choosing to obey Him when we don't really want to do that because oftentimes obedience is hard, but it's a decision of the will. I'm choosing to submit to the Lord in this, even though it's hard and it may not make sense, but it's what He says in His Word and I'm going to do it. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. May we be wise Christians. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of John the Baptist. And may we be flagpoles like him. May we be rooted in the truth of your word. May we have conviction in Jesus Christ as our Savior. May we have wisdom and may we have knowledge of you that changes us so that we make decisions that honor you, that obey you, that reflect your work in our life, that we would abide in you and depend on you, and that you would get glory in everything that we do. Lord, and if there's someone here today who has never trusted in your Son, who has never trusted in what Jesus did for them on the cross, I ask that you, that you would pray with me right now, if you want to trust in Jesus right now, please pray with me in your heart and say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that your way is right and my way is wrong and that I'm a sinner and that my sins do deserve judgment and I can't pay for my sins, I can't reconcile my sins, but I believe you when you say that you can and I believe your word that says Jesus loves me and he died for me and I trust in you Lord and I believe that when Jesus died on the cross he paid for all of my sins and that I am absolutely forgiven because of what he has done for me and because I have received it by trusting in you Lord help me to grow help me to grow not only in knowledge but also in wisdom and help me to be faithful to you and humble and submissive to your will. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus that we pray. Amen.